a great response. So the next question then is a very common one, especially for you, I'm, I'm sure, Dr. Lau. Um, I want to first say great job in your latest informal debate with Dr. Hugh Ross. Thank you. Um, I, I think I can speak for everybody when I say you really demonstrated just how scientific the young earth creation model is. Now, the topic of distant starlight was brought up in that debate and you gave some really great responses that I believe were not well countered or responded to. So my question would be this, given the biblical time scale that God created the universe roughly 6,000 years ago, how are we able to see stars and galaxies that are billions of light years away? There's more than one way God could have done it. The, the method I think that he used uh, doesn't involve any kind of supernatural activity at all. Of course, God can do, you know, God can do miracles. That's not a problem for God. So we dare not say, well, I don't understand how you could have done that, God. Therefore, you didn't do it. Well, that's absurd. I mean, you'd have to eliminate the resurrection and turning water into wine and all these things. But um, the way that I think that God got the light here is I think that he's, the, the Bible is using a synchrony convention that's different from our modern synchrony convention. Now, what's a synchrony convention? That's the idea that two clocks separated by distance are synchronized. Well, how do you decide if two clocks separated by distance are synchronized? Now, for if the distance is short, it's pretty easy. You just look at them and you say, well, they're both synchronized. But uh, if, if light takes some time to get from, to, from that clock to your eyes, then that might be a little bit of a problem. You might They might look synchronized, but in fact, one of them's a little bit of a head, head of the other, but it took more time for the light to get from one than the other. So you see, it becomes a little bit of an issue uh, when the clocks become separated by cosmic distances. And uh, it turns out, this is something that Einstein uh, wrote about, it turns out that there is no objective way to synchronize two clocks separated by a cosmic distance without assuming the speed of light in one direction. And when I mean the speed of light in one direction, most of the experiments that have been done to measure the speed of light involve either directly or indirectly a, a two-way trip. It's like you're taking light from a source, you're sending it out, bouncing it off a mirror and bringing it back and you're measuring the total time, the total distance, and you divide the distance by the time that gets the average velocity. And a lot of times people assume that it takes the light the same time to go that way as it does to go that way. But we don't really know that. And in, in fact, according to Einstein, it's impossible to know that. And people say, why would it be different in different directions? Well, I don't know, but it, it, there's no reason why it would have to be the same either. And uh, I, I found this, the concept's a little bit uh, difficult for laymen to grasp because it takes a little bit of knowledge of the physics of Einstein. And so um, I actually wrote a book about this topic called The Physics of Einstein, where it brings people up to speed on the physics that they would have to know in order to re recognize why you can't actually objectively measure the one-way speed of light because you'd need two clocks that are exactly synchronized and there is no objective way to do that in the universe. There are subjective ways to do it where you can say, I'm gonna call this synchronized and somebody else is free to disagree and say, no, I don't think they're synchronized. I think they'd be synchronized if this one was turned a little bit ahead of that one so that now they're synchronized. Uh, and, and, and the bottom line is if you use the ancient method of synchronizing clocks, which is a vis visual synchrony convention, clocks are synchronized if they look like they're synchronized basically, then light takes no time at all, even today, to get from those distant galaxies uh, to the Earth. And so it can actually arrive instantaneously. And that doesn't violate any physics. It's actually perfectly consistent with the physics that Einstein discovered. It's just that a lot of people don't know about it. And I know that's a little bit abstract. I found that it takes probably at least 20 minutes really to bring people up to speed on the basic issues so that they can comprehend the, uh, the, the thrust of the argument. But I do have a series of articles on our website at uh, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. Our latest articles are on this very issue. I've been bringing people up to speed on the starlight issue, some of the other solutions that have been proposed, and why I think this, what I call the anisotropic synchrony convention is the, is the best method. It's consistent with the physics of Einstein. Nobody can disprove it. It makes sense historically. And in that model, light can get from the farthest galaxy to the Earth immediately. It takes no time at all. And therefore, there is no distant starlight if you understand physics. Awesome. That was a great answer. Um, matter of fact, even going back to your debate two months ago with Hugh Ross, um, he objected that your distant starlight argument by asking, when we look at the sun, do we see the sun as it is now or as it was eight minutes ago? Right. So it appeared right. that by asking that question, Hugh Ross didn't fully understand the physics of Einstein. Now, what would be the best response or argument to that specific one? Yeah, yeah. When he asks that, when he asks, is it this or that? It's like asking, is a table three 
feet long or is it one yard long? And of course the answer is both. It depends on how, what, what units you choose to make the measurement with. And so whenever anybody asks that question, you know, does, does it take light eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth or does it get here instantaneously or 16 minutes? To, and the answer is it depends on the synchrony convention that you choose. There is no objective answer to that question. People get frustrated because most of us have a view of time that it's sort of absolute and universal. It's the same everywhere, clocks all tick at the same rate. Everything, you know, you don't have to worry about these synchrony problems, but Einstein discovered that is not the case. Time is not the universal objective thing we think it is. It, it's affected by motion, gravity, and things like that. And so the amount of time it takes light, now the amount of time it takes light to get from A to B and back to A, that's objective, and there, there, that, that time is objective. And there's no, uh, there, there's no getting around that. The round trip speed of light is set by God in vacuum. You can't change it. But the one-way speed depends on how you choose to synchronize clocks. And so does light take eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth, or does it take no time at all, the answer is yes. And uh, the same is true for distant stars. Does it take years for their light to get here or does it arrive here instantaneously? The answer is yes. It depends on which synchrony convention you use. And I believe the Bible is using the more ancient synchrony convention in which uh, the celestial events are marked by when you see them. And so in using that system, God created the entire universe. The light was immediately visible to earth on day four when as soon as God created the luminaries. And that gets around a lot of these other issues too of, uh, you know, people say, well, God made the light already on its way. Well, then he's making pictures of things that don't exist. This gets around all that because all the stars that we have pictures of really existed in real time. It's just that we see them immediately. Oh, I love it. Great answer. Um, we've, we've got a lively chat who are really enjoying this and who really enjoyed your uh, debate with Hugh Ross a couple months ago and, and share my opinions with it. Um, here we've got Tony Torpa question came in. Hi, Jason. Has anything been heard from Hugh Ross when you challenged him to read your article, Distant Starlight and ASC in your last debate? Thanks for your new post on the subject. They are awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, no, I haven't heard from Hugh Ross. I, I hope that he did look at that article because uh, he was under the mistaken impression that uh, light from a supernova could be used to measure the one-way speed of light. It cannot. And I had already answered that because there was a critic uh, named Peter who had uh, posted that same thing. And I demonstrated that, in fact, uh, Peter had made the assumption uh, in, in, in his question that the speed of light's the same in all directions. Otherwise, his question wouldn't make any sense. Jason Niles uh, explanation of starlight but totally ignore the fact that supernovas behind galaxies totally disrupt and destroy his argument. No, 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 actually. Uh, the fact is you get exactly the same answer for uh, when you see the light from a supernova that's been gravitationally bent. You get exactly the same answer, whether the light in one direction is instantaneous or whether it's, whether it's C or whether it's any other value that's allowed. And, and the reason for that is only light that's, light can only be instantaneous in one uh, direction relative to a, a given observer. And so the right. light from the supernova would have to go at an angle. And so it'd be a it wouldn't be quite instantaneous when it first goes out until it gets bent around the galaxy and then zips directly toward the observer. And so I answered that and uh, Hugh hasn't got back with me yet. I hope he will. If he wants to, uh, if he thinks if he thinks I'm wrong, he's welcome to challenge me and I'd be happy to post his uh, his reply and my reply to his reply and so on. <laughs> awesome, yeah, great response. I mean, it, it, it looks like, Oftentimes I find that the critics, even some of the most militant critics, just aren't really up to date on the literature on this anyways. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess you, you, you kind of uh, answered this, but a question would be, how do you feel the critics have responded to your arguments overall, Dr. Lyle, on distant starlight in a, a young universe? For example, as, as you're covering here, the one-way speed of light and synchrony conventions. In, in other words, have they provided any sufficient rebuttals? And if possible, and you did cover a couple here, what are the best possible responses to those rebuttals? I haven't seen any serious rebuttals, to be honest with you. I, uh, people who are physicists and are trained in relativity have, uh, some of them have said, well, you're, yeah, Lyle's right about that. <laughs> so, and, and of course, uh, some of the papers that, that promote an ask type uh, model like the one by Sarkar and Stachel that I like to point out. And the, the authors are not creationists, but they agree that light can get here instantaneously using the correct synchrony convention. Uh, so I haven't seen any real, I've seen internet rebuttals by, by people who don't seem to be trained in relativity. I've seen one that says, well, no, you can't 
you can't use that coordinate system where it would create a gravitational field, which we don't see. Uh, no, that's, that's not the case. Uh, switching coordinate systems does not create a gravitational field. Uh, you can measure things in polar coordinates. You can measure them in rectangular. You can measure using an Einstein synchrony convention or the anisotropic synchrony convention. It doesn't create any, um, any magnet or any uh, gravitational fields. And uh, anyway, it, actually, the, the, um, most of the ones, if you, if you go back a few months back on, on my website where I respond to Peter's objections on distant starlight, uh, most of the ones that I've seen on the internet, he repeated those and I answered them. So uh, I haven't seen any uh, ones that are a serious challenge from a physics perspective because frankly, the, the conventionality thesis upon which my model is based is really pretty well established. I consider it proved. Uh, John Winnie back in 1970 showed that all of special relativity can be um, uh, done without, without the one-way speed of light, uh, le leaving it as a free parameter, which he, the epsilon, the Reichenbach epsilon, so um, I haven't seen any rebuttals at all, really, other than ones that are kind of on the internet, <laughs> not peer-reviewed ones. Right, you're, you're gonna get that with everybody though. I mean, <laughs> you sure. see that everywhere. The internet, of course. the internet's the criticism area. Yeah. So here's one, you did answer at least the first part uh, earlier, but I'm just gonna read the entire thing for you because this was a critic question. Um, so the objectum, uh, for the sake of argument, let's accept that your claim for the round trip average speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. If this is true, and this is the one way speed of light, then in order to accommodate a 6,000 year time frame, these specific critics have stated that there is no simple, uh, simple, simply no reason to think that the one way speed of light is over 700 times faster than the round trip speed of light. Well, when, when, when people state things that way, that, that suggests to me that they're not understanding the physics of the situation. It, it'd be a little bit like say, saying, uh, you know, the metric system is clearly the correct way to measure things and not the, the English system of feet and inches. I mean, because 12 inches and a foot, I mean, that seems unlikely. Whereas meters, you know, it's 10, 10 centimeters, you know, uh, 100 centimeters in a, in a meter and so on, that, that's all 10, that's all, that, that's nice and neat. Nature clearly prefers metric over English. Well, no, it doesn't, because you see, when it comes to a convention of measurement, uh, you, you can't use Occam's razor, so well, it's more likely to be this than that. No, it isn't, it's, it's your choice. The English system, in terms of inches and feet and uh, foot pounds and so on, it is a lot more complicated, it's hard to keep track of than the metric system, it is. That's why scientists, we, we like metric. Yeah, we do all our calculations in metric, and then if we need to convert at the end, we can. But um, that doesn't mean that English units are wrong. And it's the same way with the one-way speed of light. It's not that it's this or that or the other. It's what you choose it to be. And that will, that will tell you how to synchronize two clocks that are separated by distance. And I, I know that's counterintuitive, but folks, if you're gonna, you know, if, if you're gonna argue on this principle, you need to get up to speed on the physics of this. This has been discussed. This, this topic of the one-way speed of light and its immeasurability has been discussed for over a century there's a century worth of literature out there devoted to this topic. And uh, not long ago, I, I came across a book somebody had written, uh, Max Jammer wrote a wonderful book called Concepts of Simultaneity from Antiquity to Einstein and Beyond. And it's a nice summary of the, of the, uh, the scientific literature written really pretty much at a layman level. Uh, and so that's a nice way to get to speed on these issues. But when people say, well, it's more like, the speed light's more likely to be this, and than that, or there's no evidence that it's one way or the other. No, 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 it's, it's, this is a convention of measurement. It's a convention by which we decide what we're going to call synchronized when we have two clocks separated by distance. That's all it is. And that's why there is leeway in terms of how you choose to set the one-way speed of light. It's not something that can ever be measured. It's because it's not an objective property of the universe. It's a human choice. Right. That's a great response. These critics, like you said, Dr. Lau, they need to get up to date on this. This mm -hmm. physics, as you said, is known and it's understood. Mm -hmm. And it's probably why you have not had any convincing rebuttals. So that's, that's a great response. This is awesome.